so that's the zeroing done and uh, yeah you might notice here there's a big sort of group here moved up to here that's where it was sitting initially my brother shot it I think he had shot it in for about 25 yards which is what 22 maybe 23 meters I'm shooting in at 30 uh, meters that is and obviously being 2-2 two -two, you've got a bit, bit of a trajectory but I didn't really have to do anything on the windage just moved it up and you can see here I was kind of pulling it in a bit this group here was pretty good one little flyer and this little, this uh, group here was, was pretty good too I mean this is a five pence coin you can see that group there apart from the flyer that's pretty much covered with a 5p and this one here uh, opened it up a little bit not quite covered with a 5p but still pretty respectable really to be honest if I shot groups like that with a rim fire it's certainly at 50 meters I'll be very pleased indeed so it's not bad it's pretty good it's uh, it's weird to shoot to be honest because obviously when you're used to using um you know rim fire and then you go to something like this you feel like it's almost I don't know not working properly or something but of course it is it's just air gun isn't it? it just makes virtually no sound in terms of the magazine got here look obviously I will come back to that because this is really my first impressions here but you can see it's got this uh, pin on this side and I, I, I believe you can actually take this out and, this, and the magnet and you can move it on onto the other side depending which way you want to slide it into the gun but either way it goes in and the magnet holds it and then basically you put the pellets in, you just drop them in, like that, and then just a nice sort of click, and then you just keep putting them in. And to be fair, they're pre it's pretty good. Um, I wouldn't say it was necessarily any better than the Air Arms magazine, um, but of course the advantage with this over an Air Arms magazine is that you don't have to have any kind of indexing post or anything like that that could go wrong you know to make it work but uh, yeah I'm pretty pretty happy with that so the next thing I guess is to see if I can hit anything at 50 meters so let's go and see if we can do that So here we are then, 50 meters. Um, obviously, in the last section when I was zeroing it, I just zeroed it for 30 meters, and I had to um, adjust the um, the elevation because my brother has shot it in for about I don't know 23 something like that. Windage was fine. On this section here, I um, didn't adjust the scope at all. I just used the second from bottom mill dot. And if all goes to plan, you should see what I'm talking about on your screens about now. Um, you can see there's like loads of different crosshairs. And uh, yeah, the second one from the bottom, I was just putting that on where I wanted to hit. And as I was pulling the trigger, you could see the pellet flying through the air like that. And then when it hit at 50 meters, it really does sound like a stone hitting a, 
you know, that you're throwing at a piece of wood. But, you know, it was it was pretty accurate, to be honest. You can see here, just as I was sort of working out where to aim, obviously I've got quite a few quite low ones here, and I started bringing it up, which wasn't too bad. But this is the group that you saw on camera. And strangely, it's not as clear as I'd expected, because the sticker's gone a bit weird, but that's a shoot and see target. And I put that on there just so it'd show up a little bit better. But you can see all 10 shots, except for a, a few at the top there, were on, you know, that sort of size, which is, you know, that's a rabbit's head, let's be fair. You know, that sort of size target. If I take the sticker off, because like I said, it's kind of almost covering up where I hit. Um, if I can get off without tearing it. Hopefully I can. Yeah, just about. Yeah, you should see a bit clearer now. So you've got three there, two there, two there, two there, and one there. You know, considering the distance, that's pretty good. Certainly those five, that's a dead bunny. So overall, I'm impressed. I mean, I didn't really expect to be able to reliably hit a rabbit head size target at 50 metres with a 12 foot pound air gun. But it just goes to show, you know, you can do it. it. This gun does have a lovely trigger, which helps a lot. So, you know, that may be something to do with it. But either way, let's get this on the table and uh, let's have a bit of a closer look. So here it is then, on the tabletop. As you can see, getting a bit sort of closer to it, it is visually very similar to the original Huntsman classic. Same wood, still made by Minelli in Italy. Almost exactly the same, apart from the addition of the sort of R on here. I'm not sure if this rosewood cap is an addition as well. It might be, actually. It has, obviously, as you get on almost any air rifle these days, quite a generous rubber butt pad. I always find that a strange one with air rifles. I don't know if it's just to give you extra grip in the shoulder, because, you know, my shotgun and my rimfire only have a thin piece of plastic. So in terms of recoil, I mean, it's, you know, you don't need that really, but it is what it is. The stock actually does bring up a slight bugbear for me compared to the original Huntsman Classic. And that is, I remember when the original um, Huntsman Classic came out, Tony Bilas being interviewed and then him saying, you know, the whole point of this rifle was to sort of mimic a, a 2 2 sporting rifle. And the reason, and the way they did that was they sunk the air bottle much deeper into the wood, so you couldn't really sort of necessarily really see that it was an air rifle. And at the end here, this cap was just sticking out of this wood at the end. So when they updated it, which I guess they did from feedback from their customers, you know, they wanted a bit more shot capacity, because, you know, it's now, what, 80 shots, I think, something like that in 2.2. And I guess the old Huntsman Classic may have been, what, 50 or 60? Something like that anyway. Um, but what they didn't do, what they just didn't think to do, was extend this wood. Because if it was going to be in keeping with the whole point of it looking a bit like a, you know, a sporting 2 2 rimfire, why couldn't they have just made the wood a bit longer? I mean, they took the time to put the R on the, on the handle, so, you know, they could have done that. But it's a minor quibble, really. It's just a little bit, yes, yeah, just irritates me slightly. <laughs> Other than that, on the underside, you can see here you've got the pressure gauge. And this is another bugbear of mine, because... You know, it works perfectly fine, it's in the right place, because, you know, again, as, as Rack and Load always says, it's really annoying when they put this gauge on the end of the bottle, because you end up sort of having the muzzle pointing you in the face when you're trying to see how much pressure's left in it. So that's all great, but you can see it's slightly off kilter. It needs to be really about, I don't know, a little bit anti-clockwise for it to be nice and straight and flush with the rest of the gun. I mean, obviously, that doesn't really affect the functionality or anything like that. But, you know, when you are paying a premium for an air rifle over all of the competitors, you know, I just expect a little bit better than that, to be honest. But, as I said, it doesn't affect any kind of functional factor there. Um, other than this, I mean, you've got the uh, trigger, and this is probably the sort of the real selling point with this rifle, for me anyway, because it has got a beautiful trigger. I'd say it's about... I mean, obviously, I haven't got, I'd like to do a proper sort of test on it, you know, a rack and load style with a, you know, this gauge thing. I haven't got that, but I reckon it's probably about one and a half pounds, something like that. It's very, very light. But it's also, being an air rifle, as most air rifles are, it is two-stage, so there is a bit of a take-up. And then, just like with the clutch of a car, you can feel, you know, the bite, and then it goes off. But what makes it slightly different to what I've been used to in the past 
is that the travel on the first stage is very, very small. So it's almost like the best of both worlds between having a two-stage trigger and a single-stage trigger. It's really positive. You know when it's going to bite, but there's no faffing about, and it just breaks beautifully, as you can see. Now, that might have sounded a little bit loud, um, but we are in a sort of enclosed space, but I'll get onto that in a moment or two. The other thing to mention while we're at this sort of part of the rifle is obviously you've got the uh, the bolt. It's traditional, very traditional, poly very highly polished bolt handle, which on this gun gets in the way a little bit, but my brother has like mounted this scope really low, so it's a bit fiddly, but that, you know, it's very nice. You've got the magazine. I'm not going to go into that now because I've already shown you the magazine, but it's a great system. But the only thing with the magazine that's a bit annoying is when you're in the field, it can be a bit fiddly to get in. Because if I've got it like this, and I get it just right, and I put it in just right, it literally will just almost go in on its own with the magnet. You know, it looks beautiful the way it goes in. But if you don't get it exactly right, it can be really sort of fiddly to get to go in. And the other thing that's annoying with that is with the bolt, if, you, if you're pulling it back, because you're holding the gun that way in the field, when you try and put the, the magazine in, you can't because this bit of metal gets in the way. So, I mean, you know, to a certain extent, that is really kind of just learning the gun and being used to it, but I did find that slightly annoying, to be honest, but again, it's a, yeah, it's a fairly minor quibble. One of the other things I really liked about it was the safety. The safety is quite unusual because it's like a big sort of piece of plastic and you just move it like this, but it's really positive. You can see it really well. You know, you can put it on and off at any point you want to. It's always there, you know where it is, it's, it's great. And it's probably the first safety on any air rifle that I've ever actually really bothered to use, to be honest. I've always just used my, you know, just not put my finger on the trigger, but that I've actually have used because it's just so easy and it's there and it just gives you a bit of peace of mind. The one thing I did notice though, is this bit of plastic almost like comes out. I'm not gonna pull it too hard because I think it will actually come out, but that isn't great. I expect better than that, to be honest. So, Tony, if you're watching, you know, why is that happening? <laughs> that shouldn't come out. That should be pinned or something. So, yeah, that would annoy me because, I mean, I suppose, you, you know, as long as you're careful, it should be fine. But if you did lose that, that would be really irritating, frankly. But, you know, there we are. The other thing to mention is, what, you know, while we're on the, you know, got it on this side, you've got the Foster adapter on here. It's a snap-on cap, and it's a standard Foster adapter. Now, I think that's quite unusual. Well, that's not unusual, but it's, it's, it's surprising. Because most of these, you know, different manufacturers now, like Air Arms and uh, WireArc and everyone else, they all have their own fancy new kind of fitting for filling them up. And Daystate, even though it's a sort of very much a premium product, have really kind of gone with the standard sort of Foster adapter. So, I mean, it works perfectly fine, but it's just slightly surprising. And the other thing that's a quibble with that, though, is the end cap. Because pretty much now, I mean, if you buy a, a, an Air Arms or most Air Rifles that have got a cap like this, it screws on, but this just pops on and off like that. Which you might not think is a problem, but the thing is, there is an O-ring in there. And you can already see it's, it's pretty much shredded on this one. It needs a new one. And again, when you're paying a premium for a product over all the competitors, I just expect a little bit better than that. To be honest, but you know, there we are. We've got the silencer here, as I was just talking about before. It does keep the sound down a great deal. The barrel's also shrouded, which I think makes a bit of difference. It's not huge. I mean, well, you can hear for yourself. I'll take the silencer off because I've already shown you um, what it sounds like with the silencer on. The silencer's on a half inch UNF thread, so you can put any silencer on here that you want to. The one that's on it at the moment is a. Uh, they stay, I think they're sort of carbon, supposedly carbon fibre thing. But it does go over the barrel, which is very nice. Um, it reaches to about here. So it does keep the length down, which is always good. And uh, yeah, it does keep it very quiet. It's hard to really gauge it in here because we're indoors. But out in the field, really, all you can hear is this sort of slingshot system going off, which is their sort of patented, you know, operating system on these rifles. But I'll shoot it anyway with just the shroud. And you probably can hear a fair difference. It's quite a bark. 
compared to when it's got the, sh the, the silencer on. But again, it's not too bad. I guess the shroud does do something. Not as much as you'd think, but it does do something. So overall, it looks like a very well constructed rifle. I mean, I've taken it out in the field, uh, sorry, in down the range and zeroed it. Um, as I said before, I zeroed it at 30 meters. I've checked where it's going at 50 meters. The only additional thing I've done is I've checked what it's doing at 22 meters as well. Um, and that was in my dad's garden. I didn't film that, but at 22 meters, if you look on your screens about now, you should see the uh, crosshairs. And if you look above the main crosshair, there's that little notch. And if you can imagine if there was another notch above it, about that high above, that's where it's going at 22 meters. So you do kind of need to know that because the trajectory makes a big difference when you're out sort of hunting in the field. Um, so that's about it, really. Uh, the only other thing to mention is filling it. You should see on your screens about now, I'm sort of gassing it up. Very simple procedure. Unlike a lot of rifles, you don't need to cock it before you fill it. You can just literally just pop on the adapter and then just top it up. No problem at all. So there we are. Um, that's a bit pretty much everything to say about it. The only thing to do now is get it out in the field and do some hunting and see if I can sort of head shoot some uh, feral pigeons and collar doves and that sort of thing. Maybe a rabbit, although there aren't many rabbits around this um, this year. I think a lot of them died because of Mixie. So, but either way, let's get out there and let's do some hunting.
So I've had it for the last few weeks. I've been shooting birds with it. I've been feckling with it. I've been had it at the range and a bit of target shooting. I've, you know, explored various things with it. And yeah, I mean, it, it, I can't fault it. It's fantastic. The Daystate Hudson Regal has a brilliant trigger. I really can't fault the trigger. The safety is just perfect where you want it to be. It's great. I must admit, though, for, for me, a lot of this really has been kind of, you know, going back into air gunning and rediscovering air gunning, really, in terms of, like, you know, what you can you can do. Because, obviously, when you get used to using a rimfire on a, sh on a shotgun, you kind of, um, you know, you forget about these things, really. But if you are, knowing your, if you know your ranges, and I really do mean you need to really know your ranges, and you're shooting around barns, you're shooting rats, you're doing that sort of thing, it's perfect for the job. If you're shooting rabbits, it's great. If you're ambushing them, you're wait, lying in wait and you know the range that you're going to be at and you know where that pellet's going to go, brilliant. If you though, and I know some of you guys are not going to like me saying this, but if you want to actually stalk rabbits the way I would do say with a rimfire, to be honest, I think it's, it, you know, you might be able to do it, but it's pretty almost useless if I'm honest, because you need to know exactly how far away you are from that rabbit. You need to range find it and then you might find, you know, that you've you've only sort of zeroed it at sort of five or ten meter increments so you need to move back or forward or whatever you need to get you know most of the time within like 30 meters by the time you've done all that it's going to bug it off you know you're trying to stalk you shouldn't need to worry about the gun you should, you know if you're using a rim fire you're just thinking right i'm going to get him within 50 meters if it's within 50 meters i put that crosshair on he's dead but with this if you're shooting at 20 meters or 30 meters you're talking a difference of that that's a miss so you need to be really precise so, yeah, I mean, for me, for my purposes, this is really more of a, um, a sort of vermin control gun around barns, that sort of thing, where you really know the distances that you're shooting at. But, yeah, I can't really fault it for that purpose. It's fantastic. The only thing I would say, again, this is often a controversial thing with air guns, I can't see why anybody wouldn't use a 177, because in terms of energy... 22177 are both 12 foot pounds, are exactly the same. The idea that 22's got more knockdown power is frankly rubbish. It's the same. It's the same amount of energy. So it's just a question of how do you want that energy delivered? Do you want a big loopy lump of lead? Or do you want a nice relatively flat lump of lead where it's going to be more forgiving with the ranges? Because that's what it really comes down to, knowing what range you're at. I can't emphasize that enough. But overall, I would say it's great. Go out and buy one. In fact, I'm almost tempted to trade my S310, my Air Arms S310 in to get one of these because they've really moved on in the last what, 20 years or whatever it is since I bought it. It's, yeah, I can't fault it. So, yeah, go out and buy one.